Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 24, The End of the Line, and a Guy Named Magnus. The 50 years of peace from the settling of Constantine as emperor, ending as his sons died in the middle of the 4th century. This end brought again usurpers and pretenders from Britain, along with other places. Britain at the time was considered the breadbasket of the Roman Empire, and it had been a consistent thorn in the side of many Roman emperors. First, in 350, Magnetius kills Constan, who is the son of the former emperor Constantine, and rises up strong enough to capture the Western Empire, only three years later to be himself killed by the Eastern Emperor Constantinus II. The British support for Magnentius was strong enough that it warranted severe punishment from Constantinus. Britain was getting fairly powerful, and apparently sought to express that power in the larger empire. Britain had so far, from the 4th century, escaped the ravages of the outsiders. This made them very wealthy, but also made them a hotbed of troublemakers. Piracy was fended off by the Saxon shore, and the raiders from Scotland typically only bothered with the northern half of the territory, leaving the wealthy southern half mostly safe. Many of the sources from this period talk about how Britain grain fed the empire. This means that what the wealthy returned to the province, and once again luxury goods, grand building plans, and land holdings increased. The breadbasket of Rome was doing very well indeed. However, trouble continued to develop in the north, in 360, just 10 years after the end of Magnetius, there were invaders, Picts, and Scots, Scots being Irishmen, who became enough of a problem to warrant the Roman military to call out for more assistance from the mainland, but apparently this assistance never really showed up. And this is really the start of where everything starts to go sideways in Britain, because once you can't trust the empire to send out help it becomes more and more apparent that you're not going to receive further help down the road, and that will continue to be the case as time goes on. The Roman concerns were more stretched with immediate needs in other parts of its massive territory. In the east, the Persians were causing trouble. In the north, in Germany and other places, they had problems with the Goths and other Germanic tribes who now were pushing into the empire, not only taking positions of military power, but also grabbing land and terrorizing the Romans from without and within. In 365, and then again in 367, raiders and pirates continued to cause massive problems for the British. The Picts and the Scots, and now another Irish tribe, the Atacati, attacked in the north and the west of Britain. In 367 AD, it became particularly perilous, as joining them were the Saxons and the Franks, now raiding the eastern half of Britain. They actually caused so much trouble that it was commented on by historians both at the time and later on. Uh, the Roman historian Amenaeus called it the Barbarian Conspirato, better known as the Barbarian Conspiracy. Historians believe this is what Gildas in the 6th century was referring to when he said, Like greedy wolves, rabid with extreme hunger, who dry mouth leap over into the sheepfold when the shepherd is away, they came, relying on their oars as wings, on the arms of their oarsmen, and on the winds swelling their sails. They broke through the frontier, spreading destruction everywhere. And in destruction is exactly what they did. To show how far they were able to range, the raiders actually reached the Thames, and in fact sacked London. They were able to kill the Count of the Saxon shore, Nicaratus, and they captured the military leader, of Britain at the time, Philetus, the Duke Britannarium, who at the time was leading all the military in Roman Britain. In truth, the rout of the Romans in Britain was a disaster that only ended when Count Theodosius arrived with 2,000 men, defeating the raiders and stopping the pillaging. He may have even actually, there is some speculation, dealt with some of the locals who'd gotten involved. Um, by 383 AD, the world had changed for Roman Britain. Welsh people who had never had any other lifestyle, like their ancestors seemingly for time immemorial, had served the empire, or so it may have been in their eyes for ne after nearly 400 years of settlement. Slowly, this started to change. During the recent military reorganization, a new position was set in place. The Dux Britannia, or the military leader of Britain, became a very important position. 
This would also play a role in the defense of Britain and even into the 5th century as it would later be called the High King. There were now a number of provinces and it was hoped that the emperors would be able to put an end to the power struggle by uniting the country and stop creating pretenders by creating so many provinces that there was no real power base for them. If that was the hope, they failed miserably, because in this very year of 383 AD, a new usurper arose named Magnus Maximus. Now, Maximus is well known to Welsh history. He has a number of legends attached to him. Uh, he was actually not born in Britain, but was raised as emperor after his assigning there. He was actually assigned to Britain in 380 AD. Uh, at this point, it is speculated he's about 45. Um, he ended up defeating an incursion of Scots and Picts, and when the Western Emperor Gratian became unpopular, they turned his own troops, and obviously the British, turned to him and proclaimed him emperor. Uh, he then went to Gaul to pursue his imperial ambitions, much like every other usurper we've talked about in the past. There is a tendency for them to then try and head to Rome to take over, there is a number of legends surrounding him. He is one of the few of the usurpers to actually receive a Welsh name. Uh, and because of that, he is remembered quite differently than he probably was in the Roman history, where he was defeated very quickly. In fact, by... So in 387, Maximus managed to force the emperor Valentinian II out of Milan, after which he then fled to the eastern emperor Theodosius I, between the two of them, they then came back east and fought Maximus through July and August of 388, eventually defeating him in a number of battles, including the Battle of the Save, and he retreated to Aquileia. Meanwhile, his brother was then defeated shortly thereafter. Eventually, the emperors take him on and defeat him and then capture him. He is then executed, and the Senate passes a decree against him. However, at least his mother and two daughters were spared. Uh, and his son, however, met a rather gruesome fate of being strangled to death. So, in other words, the last great British usurper was destroyed. And with it, a lot of the military that was in Britain, and especially in Wales, was removed. Maximus, as every other usurper before him took his troops with him when he left and unlike every other time nobody came to take their place this time there was no new military maximus actually set up within his military uh, an acknowledgement that the locals need to protect themselves amongst again legendary sources there's this idea that he helped britain defend itself but Realistically, it's hard to know whether that was already starting to be the case anyway. Uh, we do know that, as we've said in previous occasions, the Romans had hired out mercenaries and barbarian uh, tribes to help defend them, much like they did the Atticati. But in this particular occasion, it appears that either it was given over to the locals, or in some cases, there just wasn't anything Uh one of the forts we talked about before, Saguntium, in uh, Carnarvon, was actually abandoned at this point, and at 390, most of the military in Wales is gone. So, your police force, your protectors, your tradesmen, your everything that sort of organizes and keeps the peace is now removed from the state. And as you can imagine, in those circumstances, that creates and can create chaos. There are ideas of trying to protect the coasts. You can see that there were attempts at times to try and maintain various camps and various military sites, but Irish raiding continues through the end of the century, and this developed into full-blown settlement in Wales. There are even Irish sources uh, which we're now discussing a raiding of Britain. And in 396 AD, the last major attempt was made to defeat these raiders uh, as Constantinus III was sent to try and deal with them. They had a middling amount of success, I would argue, considering they didn't force them out. But what they did do is they actually took the Atticati, and this is when they were recruited to fight on the continent. At this point, we start to have this 
gradual withdrawal of Roman troops throughout Britain that had started as sort of a, a, a drip was now a flood. And by 407 AD, the last of the troops were removed in dealing with the problems that were going on through the Roman area at this time. You know, as much as at this stage Roman Britain had been important, it wasn't the key to the kingdom. And the reality of it was for the Western emperors, Gaul and uh, Spain and most importantly, Italy needed to be defended and protected. And you couldn't do that if you were sending too many troops out to Britain. So at 407 is really the last time when you have what would be called Roman power. There is talk even amongst the sources at the time that from this time on, British tyrants ran Britain. Uh, how these tyrants shaped up, how they coordinated and how they organized is a matter of question. But by this point, the state of decay was such that there was a breakdown in the basis of Roman links and Roman uh, lineage. Coinage stops largely being spent in Britain. Much of the industrial evidences that we have of things like Samian ware that we've discussed previously and other pottery comes to an end in this period. In fact, pottery takes a massive step back over the next hundred years. Most of the architectural landscape starts to change as people are pulling back from the excesses of the fourth century. You end up finding that you'll see Roman buildings just cease to be maintained as they fall apart. Obviously, if you don't have the ability to maintain them, they become basically albatrosses for those people, and so they will start to put them aside and move back into roundhouses and move into newer housing, which is about a half or a third the size. The other thing that happens is you find that people start to move out of them altogether. The Sivatas and all of these massive towns that had become so important to the Roman British countryside and to the economy and to everything that kept Roman Britain afloat now fall to pieces. And we find that by the end of the 5th century, this will be a link that is more or less broken. But even amongst all these things, even as this is happening and as this change continues to go forward, there is still a division between the groups as to what they are and who they are. Even as late as the time of Gildas, there's still talk in the 6th century about being Romans, uh, about wearing the purple, about being noble, about this concept of being something of a Roman Britain as opposed to being just a Briton. And this divide between these groups maintains part of the problem that comes to them and part of the split because the old society and the old ideas about Britain are now taking hold on some. And there's a new problem that's come about in all of this. As we've talked about in the past a number of occasions, we've talked about the Germanic tribes that were brought over to defend, uh, the Belgic tribes that we mentioned previously that were actually in Britain and probably carried on, as I said, building relationships within Britain as former Gaul tribes were brought over to serve as military mercenaries to protect the Hadrian's Wall. All of these people to some extent are still there for at least a small time because you don't just bring over yourself, you bring over your family. As we noted previously, some of the family members are still in Britain at this point. You have this group of people coming out of the Germanic areas around the coasts of Denmark now being brought over to work as mercenaries. They serve in what's called the Federati, or the Fetteratus, which is settled barbarians. Uh, these are mercenaries who are then bought and paid for. They serve the Roman Empire. They serve as Romans and will serve in military positions and in some cases become part of the problem later on because once military government starts to break down, these groups start to go on their own idea of what they want. And after having modeled so much of the Roman Empire, they want a piece of it themselves. And one of these groups, or a few of these groups, start to settle in Britain. Uh, over the period of the 4th century, we've seen and talked about the Saxons and the Franks. But as well, likely there were other groups. I mean, 
one of the things we know about is is the mentions of Angles, Saxons, Jutes, uh, Frisians. All of these groups have started to move to Britain, initially as settlers and as military people serving the government. Uh, eventually, they start to come over in more and more settlement. And this will create its own set of friction as people, again, start to cling back on older roots. They start to pick up different cultural ideas. And this will create the major divisions that we get in the coming centuries. And at this point is when everything starts to go crazy. And this is where legend and history start to intertwine. And our sources are so scant that it's very difficult to make heads or tails of what's a legend, what's truth, what's possibly truth wrapped up in a legend, and what's legend that has been called truth. And much of it we're going to discuss, much of it we don't really have a good concept of what's gone on. Thankfully, we do have some archaeology that can help us. We have sources that can help us. Some of the sources, of course, are polemical in nature. Uh, Gildas is very much a polemic. We'll talk more about these people in the coming couple of episodes. And once you kind of understand how this is happening, then it makes more sense. Like, we always think of the, the arrival of the Saxons as happening as the Romans have left. The reality of it is the Saxonization of Britain began much earlier than that, probably up to 50 to 100 years earlier than that. Uh, but because the sources have always told us there's one way that this has happened, we don't realize that there could be other things going on and other reasons, and that the sources who are talking to us, in one case 100 years later, and in other cases hundreds of years later, don't necessarily know the truth, and are couching everything in absolutes. And so we have to be very careful with these kind of things, and we have to give pause when we talk about them. So we'll go carefully through this. As we go forward in the next little bit, we're going to talk about the myth and the legends and the darkness that arrives in that century. And then we're going to talk more about Celtic legends, because one of the things that will happen now is you have... As happens throughout the Western Roman Empire, as it begins to collapse in the in the fifth century, we end up having the only real remaining sign of it being Christianity. And Christianity hasn't gone out of existence in Britain at this stage. There's a lot of talk about how it ceased to exist. And at one point, I think there was a belief that everybody went back to paganism. But I think we can argue fairly clearly that as I did in the last episode, there is Christianity within Roman Britain at the time. It doesn't cease to exist simply because the Roman infrastructure ceases to exist. It maintains itself in its own way. Do some people go back to paganism? Yes, I believe that's true because, we'll, as we'll discuss later, we'll see that some of the old legends take foot here. The other thing is you have groups that are pagan who are now coming into these areas. The Irish have a massive influence on the Welsh at this stage. They've invaded North Wales, they'll invade South Wales, and they'll start not just to be raiders and pirates, but settlers as well. There is a grand movement going on during this period. The, the rush of humanity throughout Europe creates massive sea change in all of society, down to the smallest of categories and the smallest of people. And so as you see that, you also see that their ideas will also get merged into their new home and they'll bring with them their culture and their, their concepts and their religion. And all of this will then influence those that are already there. So you can be sure that because of that, we're going to see some massive changes in Britain and we'll see the arising of more paganism. We'll see the arising of Christianity as the Celts understood it to be and how that influences things. And we'll see the arrival of the Celts into the medieval era. The Roman Britons will cease to be Roman Britons and become just Britons. And they'll have to deal with these interlopers called the Saxons who have intermarried, intermingled, and now are turning their cultural norms against the Brit you know, the original British settlers. And we'll talk about exactly how influential they were and what their makeup is and how archaeology helps and hinders us in this category. And 
As always, I hope you'll stick with me. I hope you're enjoying this series. As we continue to go forward, I would just like to remind everybody that we have our fundraiser coming up in just a couple of weeks. We are looking to raise money for the Children's Miracle Network. Please check out our donations page at uh, distractionsmedia.com forward slash donations. On another note, however, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or anything else you want to talk to me about, you can talk to me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. I try and answer back as quickly as I can. Same thing goes for Twitter, where I'm at Welsh History Pod. And you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. Until next week, I hope you all have a great day. Bye bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.